Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Derek Kane, and today we're going to get into the topics of modern regression approaches. This tutorial is just one part of a broader series of lectures diving into topics of uh, data science, predictive analytics, and machine learning. Okay, let's begin. The overview of topics that we're going to get into today are going to include, we're going to talk a little bit about advancements with regression analysis. Then we'll shift gears and we'll focus on rich regression. Then we will talk about the lasso technique and elastic nets. And once we've done all of that, then we will get into a practical example where we'll walk through a data set related to prostate cancer. If we continue to draw from OLS as our only approach to linear regression techniques, methodologically speaking, we're still within the late 1800s and early 1900s time frame. So when most people learn about regression analysis, um, typically in an undergraduate or even in a graduate level, depending on what you're looking at, we're really just looking at OLS. Okay, but uh, it's been around for a long time. It's a very powerful technique, but perhaps there's more. With advancements in computing technology, regression analysis can be calculated using a variety of different statistical techniques, which has led to the development of new tools and methods. And that's exactly the point that we're going to get into today, so we're going to talk about these methods. Okay. And the techniques that we're going to get into today will bring us up to date with advancements in regression analysis as a whole. Now one thing to consider, okay, well why can't I just use OLS? Well, in modern data analysis, we find that we have data with a very high number of independent variables. Okay, so you can have um, many variables that you're working with, and this is referred to as a, a higher dimensional modeling. And we need better regression techniques to handle this type of modeling. And the techniques that we're going to get into today um, really uh, work very well with this scenario. Before we dive into the more advanced topics of regression analysis, I think it's important that we just do a very basic review of OLS techniques and just how to look at the models. Because we will get into some matrix notation and some other ways to go about calculating regression a little later, but we need to have a firm understanding of all the components. So if you want to, to look at this in greater detail, please refer back to the lecture on the uh, regression analysis earlier in the series. But for now, let's just go ahead and take a look at the model. So this is the standard form that we have. We have y equals beta naught plus beta 1 times x1 plus error term. So y in this case is our dependent variable. That's what we're trying to predict. x1 represents our independent variable. Beta 1 is our coefficient in this case. Beta naught is a coefficient in and of itself, but it's generally referred to as the intercept. And the E is the error term. Now the error term is the value that's needed to correct for a prediction error between the observed and predicted value. And this error term is going to become more important as we start diving into these techniques down the road. So just just remember that when we make a prediction, our prediction isn't going to be correct for every observation. So the error term is kind of like a buffer that is used to correct um, the difference between our predicted and our observed value, and it's flexible. So the output of a regression analysis will produce a coefficient table similar to the one that we have below. This table shows that the intercept is minus 114.326 and the height coefficient is 106.505 plus or minus 11.55, which is the standard error in this case. And this can be interpreted as for each unit increase in x, we can expect that y will increase by 106.5. Now also the t-value and the 
p-values indicate that these variables are statistically significant at the 0 0.05 level and can be included in the model. So we want statistically significant variables, and we want them to be less than 0 0.05. Now let's take a look at a multiple linear regression formula. It's essentially the same as the simple linear regression, except for there can be multiple coefficients and independent variables. Now the interpretation of the coefficient is slightly different than in a simple linear regression. Okay. So if we look at our output of our OLS regression model, uh, the interpretation can be thought of for each one unit change in width, increases y by 94.56, and this is while holding all other coefficients constant. And that holding of the other coefficients constant, constant is what's important in this case. Okay. Now that we've talked a little bit about the basic model structure for regression analysis, I want to get into the topic of ordinary least squares, or at least just uh, refresh ourselves on it. So what is ordinary least squares, or OLS? In statistics, ordinary least squares, or linear least squares, is a method for estimating the unknown parameters in a linear regression model. The goal of OLS is to minimize the differences between the observed responses in some arbitrary data set and the responses predicted by the linear approximation of the data. So what it is trying to do is it's trying to find a, a line that goes through all of the data points that minimizes the errors. Visually, this is seen as the sum of the vertical distance between each data point in the set and the corresponding point on the regression line. The smaller the differences, or the square size, the better the model fits the data. So I just want to take just one minute just to look at this line. So imagine I create my formula and it produces a line which is represented by this blue line here. If I was to take each data point and draw a line from the data point that, uh, that connects to this regression line, I can then create a square from this line. And the size of the squares of all of the different data points are visually represented here. But if I sum all of these squares or the area of the squares, I'm trying to minimize the difference of these ordinary least squares. And so what ordinary least squares essentially is saying is that I'm producing the sum of squares that is of the smallest size possible, therefore having or producing a regression line that uh, best fits all of these data points in a linear fashion. Well, now that we've talked about this OLS regression and the sum of squares, I want to talk a little more about the error term. Okay? The sum of squares is a representation of the error for our OLS regression model. We're trying to minimize that, that degree of error. But when we think of linear regression models, Prediction errors, or these errors, can actually be de decomposed into two main sum components that we care about. And this is the error due to bias and the error due to variance. And we'll talk about these two points in the upcoming slides. Understanding bias and variance is critical for understanding the behavior of prediction models. But in general, what we really care about is the overall error, not the specific decomposition. So it's important to understand the bias and variance, but really what we care about is the general overall error. Understanding how different sources of error lead to bias and variance helps us improve the data fitting process, resulting in more accurate models. And it's the accuracy of the models that really is what we're trying to ultimately produce with our predictive techniques. I want to take a moment and talk about bias and variance trade-off so we can kind of really visually understand it because I know these are abstract concepts. We have an error due to bias and that error 
is taken as a difference between our expected prediction of our model and the correct value for which we're trying to predict. The error due to variance is the error due to variance is taken as the variability of a model prediction for a given data point. Imagine you can repeat the entire model building process multiple times. The variance is how much the predictions for a given point vary between different realizations of the model. And so that kind of gives us a clue of how the variance component works. But let's just take a, a moment and let's take a look at these, uh, these targets or these archery targets as what they look like. If I have a model that is very accurate, which means its errors are going to be very low, I would expect to have low bias and low variance. Okay, and we see this in the top left hand side. So the bullseye would be the most accurate model. We see all the different data points kind of fit within that bullseye. Okay, and th that's how we know we have a very um, powerful model. But imagine we just take a look down, so in the bottom left hand side. So I have a low variance but a high bias. So my bias is just, it's off center. Okay, so it's not hitting the bullseye, but it's now in this blue region, but all the spread of the data points are actually very compact. They're like where we would see them in the bullseye. They're just, um, they're just off center. And that off center really indicates a high degree of bias. Now, if I have low bias, but a high variance, which we see in the upper right-hand corner, we see that the points are generally spread very close to the center. Okay, so I can say I'm hitting the center of the target, but the high degree of variance is now taking this compact nature of these points and it's spreading them okay, uh, around. And that high variance means that even though it's centered, it's not as accurate as it could be. And if we have models that have a high bias and a high variance, as we see in the bottom right-hand side of this image, we see that it's not centered directly on the target. It's, in this case, it's in the upper um, part of the target. And we see that the spread isn't very compact as well. Okay, so I, so I think when we look at um, the different sources of error and the trade-off between all uh, these sources of error, this, this image is a very good one to go back to. So there is a trade-off between a model's ability to minimize bias, bias and variance. Understanding these two types of error can help us diagnose model results and avoid the mistake of over or underfitting. Okay, so there's a trade-off. The sweet spot for any model is the level of complexity at which the increase in bias is equivalent to the reduction in variance. Okay. Bias is reduced and variance is increased in relation to model complexity. As more and more parameters are added to the model, the complexity of the model rises and variance becomes our primary concern while bias steadily falls. So looking at this image on the left-hand side, you, you can see where the trade-off is in terms of the complexity of the model. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find that optimum point um, that minimizes uh, the trade-off between various and variance and bias. And an example of more complexity is if we add more, let's say, polynomial terms to a linear regression, the this model is now becoming even more complex um, because we're performing mathematical iterations on, uh, on the independent variables and the complexity will, will naturally rise. The Gauss-Markov theorem states that among all linear unbiased estimates or ordinary least squares has the smallest variance. And this implies that our OLS estimates have the smallest mean squared error among linear estimators with no bias. Well, this begs an important question. Can there be a biased estimator with a smaller mean squared error? 
So if I have an OLS model, I know I have the smallest variance I can possibly have. But could there be another model that reduces the error even further? Okay. And, that, and that's really the class of regression models that we're going to be talking about here. As we dive deeper into these more advanced regression models, we have to first understand the concept of shrinkage estimators. So let's consider something that initially seems really crazy. We're going to replace our OLS estimates beta with something slightly smaller. So in this case, I have a formula um, where I have beta prime is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus lambda times beta k. And what this is telling us is that if lambda is zero, we get our OLS estimates back. And if lambda gets really large, the parameter estimate approaches a minimal value, and it actually approaches uh, zero. Lambda is referred to as the shrinkage estimator, or ridge constant, depending on how you're looking at it. In principle, with the right choice of lambda, we can get an estimator with a better mean squared error. The estimate is not unbiased, but what we pay for in the increase in bias, we make up for in the variance. To find the minimum lambda by balancing the two terms, we get the following expression. Therefore, if all of the coefficients are large relative to their variances, we set lambda to be very small. On the other hand, if we have a number of small coefficients, we want to, to pull them closer to zero by setting the lambda to be very large. If we're trying to establish a good value of lambda, with the optimal being this specification, do we ever really have access to this information? And that's a really great question. Suppose we know uh, sigma squared. In the early 1960s, Charles Stein, working with graduate student Willard James, came up with this following specification. I'm not going to get too much into the mathematics. It's going to get a little mathematics heavy in the next couple of slides. But just understand that they came up with this statistical specification. This formula was expanded upon by Stanley Sclave in the late 1960s. Stanley's proposal was to shrink the estimates to zero if we get a negative value, in this case, where x plus is the max of x to zero. If sigma squared is unknown, he proposed that, that we use the following criterion in its place for some value of c. This particular formula can be re-expressed as the following, and then expressing the Sclave's estimate as the following specification. What this tells us is that this statement reads that we will set the coefficients to zero unless f is greater than some value of c. Alternatively, the result shows that we set the coefficients to zero if we fail an f-test with a significance level set by the value of c. If we pass the f-test, then we shrink the coefficients by an amount determined by how strongly the F statistic protests the null hypothesis. So these brilliant statisticians came up with a way for us to essentially create a statistical test on whether or not we should shrink a parameter in this case. And it follows the following formulas that we had just taken a look at. And to me, this is just an absolute brilliant piece of mathematical work um, by these statisticians. This preliminary testing procedure acts to either kill coefficients or keeps them, and it shrinks them. Okay. This is kind of like a model selection criteria, except that it kills all the coefficients, unlike the keep or kill rules experienced with AIC and BIC. Now, we know that simple model selection via AIC and BIC can be applied to regular regressions. This is known. We use it in our forward, our backwards, or our stepwise approach. And this is the formula to calculate um, these criterion, if you didn't already know. 
But what about these shrinkage uh, parameters? Can we use them um, for determining coefficients? Before we dive into that point, I want to now introduce the topic of ridge regression. And ridge regression is a modeling technique that works to solve the multicollinearity problem in OLS models through the incorporation of this shrinkage parameter, this lambda that we've been talking about. The assumptions of the model are the same as OLS. Linearity, constant variance, and independence. However, normality does not need to be assumed in this case. And additionally, multiple linear regression has no manner to identify a smaller subset of important variables. We use AIC and BIC as a selection uh, criteria, but in the actual regression formula itself, there is no manner to identify a smaller subset of important variables. In OLS regression, the form of the equation y equals beta naught plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2, etc. plus the error term can actually be represented in matrix notation as follows. Again, I'm not going to get too much into the description of the mathematical terms, but just understand that we can uh, re-represent this equation in matrix notation. So we can actually take this equation and we can actually rearrange it to show the following. So we can actually solve, in this case, um, for our coefficients. And where r is equal to x prime x. And r, in this case, is a correlation matrix of the independent variables. Here is the rearranged OLS equation, again from the previous slide. And I just want to keep this equation just kind of sitting in the back of our, of our mind. Because when, once we start getting into the ridge regression statement of the formula, we'll understand why it's called ridge and we can draw from it from there. But when we look at this, the estimates are unbiased, so the expected values of the estimates are the population values. The variance covariance matrix of these estimates is specified as following. And this is true because we are assuming that the y's are standardized which is a sigma squared is equal to 1 in this case. Now that we've talked about the OLS statement, let's get into ridge regression. Ridge regression proceeds by adding a small value, lambda, to the diagonal elements of the correlation matrix. This is where ridge regression gets its name, since the diagonal of 1's may be thought of as a ridge. So you can, if you're looking at a matrix um, on the off diagonal is where we see this ridge estimate and that it kind of creates kind of a peak similar to what we would expect to see at the top of a mountain. But the specification in this case, we see it's very similar to OLS except for it now incorporates this ridge, um, this ridge constant. Now lambda is a positive value less than 1. It's usually less than 0.3. Okay. Oh. The amount of the bias of the estimator is given by the following equation, and the covariance matrix is given by the following equation in matrix notation as well. Now that we've talked about the basics of ridge regression, let's get into some of the diagnostics one of the main obstacles in using ridge regression is choosing an appropriate value of lambda. The inventors of ridge regression suggested using a graphic, which they call a ridge trace. A ridge trace is a plot that shows the ridge regression coefficients as a function of lambda. When viewing the ridge trace, we are looking for the lambda for which the regression coefficients have stabilized. Often the coefficients will vary widely for small values of lambda and then stabilize. Then we choose the smallest value of lambda possible, which introduces the smallest bias, after which the regression coefficients seem to have remained constant. So if we look on our trace chart on the left-hand side, all these various dotted lines represent um, each coefficient and we see that they're kind of wide. It almost is like a funnel tipped on its side. 
And as we increase the value, we see that they begin to converge and they, they stabilize. We see more of a straight line. And if we were to actually extend this ridge parameter out um, to near infinity, we would see that um, all of these coefficients would converge at zero. But what we're looking for is the smallest lambda value where these coefficients stabilize. And we will get into that uh, in the next couple of slides. We'll, we'll look at some examples. And as I had stated before, increasing lambda will eventually drive the regression coefficients to zero. In this example, the values of lambda are shown on a logarithmic scale. I've drawn a vertical line at the selected value of lambda equals 0 0.006. We see that lambda has little effect until lambda is about 0.001, and the action seems to stop somewhere near 0.006. Now, there are a couple things to note in this. Um, the vertical axis contains points for the least square solution. These are labeled as 0.0001. Okay. And the reason that it's not zero is that uh, we can't actually see that when we're on a logarithmic scale. So if the logarithm of zero is taken, it's actually negative infinity. So how do we graph this? In this case, we can't, and that's why um, we put those points as 0 0.0001. Alternatively, there is a procedure in R which automatically selects the lowest value for lambda. This is great. This is very similar to the Box-Cox test that we've gone over previously. The value is calculated using a general cross-validation procedure, and it's called GVC in this case. The example on the left shows the value as 6.5, which is the lowest point on the curve. So we're trying to identify that minimal point on the curve. Now, one thing to note, that range of lambda uh, we need to re-specify it for each model that we're building okay? because lambda can take a value very small or it can be a, a very large value. So whenever we're working with this, um, just make sure that you're re-specifying the bounds in your procedure. And here's a snippet of some R code that we can look at in this case to show how it works. So I'm using a select Function. I have my lm.ridge, uh, which is how R is calling this particular function. And then I specify my regression model, um, very similar to how I would a, an OLS regression. But then I have to specify lambda. And in this case, the sequence of lambda is very important. It's saying, give me a value between 0 and 1, in increasing by 0 0.001 increments. So that's the sequence that we're going to have to specify. You know, if if we don't see a good value between 0 and 1, okay, we'll change that 1 to 100, and maybe change that 0 0.001 to 0 0.1. And play around with this until we find you know, what, what works for the model. Here is a visual representation of the ridge coefficients for lambda versus a linear regression. We can see that the size of the coefficients, which are penalized, has decreased through our shrinking function. Okay, and this is our penalization function, and we'll get into this a, a little more later. It is also important to point out that in ridge regression, we usually leave the intercept unpenalized because it is not in the same scale as the other predictors. The lambda is unfair if the predictor variables are not on the same scale. And so typically in ridge regression, what we'll do is we will actually scale all of the coefficients. So in order to talk about the terms in, in an equal footing, we scale them down, create our model and our parameter estimates, and then rescale back up to the original values of our independent variables. Okay, And this is because of the issues that we see um, with uh, the intercept in this case. Okay, so whenever you're working with ridge regression, just remember I need to scale, build my model, 
and then rescale after I'm done. So we talked about variable selection procedures and how this lambda could come into play here. Uh, I want to talk more about variable selection. The problem of picking out the relevant variables from a larger set is really what variable selection is. Suppose there is a subset of coefficients that are identically zero. This means that the mean response doesn't depend on these predictors at all. The red paths on the plot on the left-hand side are the true non-zero coefficients, and the gray paths are the true zeros. The vertical dashed line is the point which ridge regression's mean squared error starts losing to linear regression. So once we start moving past that point in the line, OLS becomes a better predictor in this case. Note. The gray coefficient paths are not exactly zero. They are shrunken, but they are non-zero. Even though that they're converging near that zero line, they will never actually be zero. But what's important when looking at this particular graph is that we see that the variables, um, that there's different groups of them. We have the red and the gray groups, and we see that all the gray ones are going to converge around zero eventually, but the red ones are going to take longer. So we have really what we're talking about as true zero coefficients and true non-zero coefficients. Well, what does this mean exactly? Well, we can show that ridge regression doesn't set the coefficients exactly to zero unless lambda equals infinity, in which case they are all zero. Therefore, ridge regression cannot perform variable selection. It's just, it's not robust enough. Ridge regression performs well when there is a subset of true coefficients that are small or zero. And this is an important consideration when working with ridge regression. It doesn't, however, do well when all of the true coefficients are moderately large. However, it will still perform better than OLS regression, okay, but it, ridge regression even runs into its own problems um, when all of the true coefficients are large. So what can we do about that? How, how can we address that? Are there other techniques that we can employ? Well, it turns out there is. Now that we've talked about ridge regression, let's get into the topic of lasso. The lasso combines some of the shrinking advantages of ridge regression with variable selection. Okay, so it's overcome the limitations of ridge regression in this case. And lasso is an acronym for least absolute selection and shrinkage operator. The lasso is very competitive with ridge regression in regards to prediction error. Okay, so they, both of them are going to give very strong um, MSEs but we're going to gain some advantages with the lasso that we're going to see. The only difference between the lasso and ridge regression is that the ridge um, penalty term, L2, uses the beta squared penalty, where the lasso penalty 1 uses the beta penalty. And we'll get more into this later. Okay, so we have to introduce these penalty terms in order um, to work with these techniques. Even though these penalty terms, these penalty 1 and penalty 2, look very similar, okay, their solutions, they behave very differently. And it's the nuances of how these penalty terms work uh, that gives lasso its strength. The tuning parameter of lambda controls the strength of the penalty. And like ridge regression, we get that the the coefficients of lasso is equal to the OLS estimate when lambda is equal to zero, and the coefficients of lasso approach to zero when lambda is approaching infinity. For lambda in between these two extremes, we are balancing two ideas. 
fitting a linear model of y on x and shrinking the coefficients. The nature of the penalty, L1 in this case, causes some of the coefficients to be shrunken to zero exactly. Okay, and this zero exactly is very important in the, in the lasso world. This is what makes lasso different than ridge regression. It is able to perform variable selection in the line, linear model. So if I imagine I have a, an independent variable and I am extending it by a coefficient. Well, if the coefficient is zero in this case, I'm going to multiply my independent variable um, by zero, which is going to make it zero. When that happens, um, we're effectively removing that variable from our final, mo final model. So as lasso is shrinking the coefficients and those which settle on zero, it actually is performing variable selection because it's saying, hey, this variable no longer helps me in my model, eliminate it. Okay, and that's, that's the difference between lasso and ridge. Lasso will take you exactly to zero and ridge will just kind of converge towards zero eventually, towards infinity. And as I had said, as lambda increases, more coefficients are set to zero, less variables are selected. And among non-zero coefficients, more shrinkage is employed. So as our lambda gets higher, it's performing more of this shrinking on the coefficient estimates. Because the lasso sets the coefficients to exactly zero, it performs variable selection in the linear model. So if I'm looking at my ridge regression from earlier, we see that, uh, that the coefficients stabilize to a point, and we see that they're moving down towards the zero, okay, but they don't exactly hit the zero mark. Whereas lasso, in this case, as we increase our lambda, it is incorporating more of this penalty function and at higher values of lambda, we see all of the variables converge at zero. Okay. And this, this convergence uh, actually gives us some indication in terms of variable importance and strength. So the variables with the largest lambda values in lasso that converge to zero indicate the most desirable variables for the model. So we can use this plot as kind of an indication of which variables are more important than others. Now there are some alternative plots that we can look at. In this case, we can use plots of the degrees of freedom to put different estimates on equal footing. So if we want to look at uh, these coefficients in a similar manner across these techniques. So if I'm looking at ridge regression, here it is um, plotted, plotted against the degrees of freedom of the lambda versus lasso. We see that the shape is actually different in and of itself. We see that ridge has these kind of nice curves and linear lines that come out, whereas lasso is more rounded in this case. Okay, But we can now look at them in equal context, and that's, that's a, a great technique and it's um, readily available in, in your statistical package of choice. I know it can be done in R, um, I'm assuming that in SAS as well. And as before, we can see that uh, the most important variables can be readily identified um, because they are significantly higher than that uh, 0, 0.0 um, horizontal line. It can be helpful to think about our penalty terms, okay, the penalty 1 and penalty 2 parameters, in the following form. And I want to get into these penalty terms because it, it can be kind of confusing. okay. But in order to understand the techniques, let's just look at this mathematical form that we have here. Okay. So these lambda terms are the penalty 1 and the penalty 2 for both the lasso and the ridge. But we can think of this formula now in a constrained, penalized form. Okay. So we can actually uh, constrain and penalize this particular function. T in this case is a tuning parameter, and we've been calling this lambda earlier, but um, you can think of it as a tuning parameter, very similar to lambda. 
the usual OLS regression solves the unconstrained least squares problem. These estimates constrain the coefficient vector to lie in some geometric shape centered around the origin, and that constrained form, this geometric shape centering around the origin, actually um, gives us some clues on how these models function. And we're going to take a look at a couple of these um, shapes. The shape that we choose generally reduces the variance because it keeps the estimate close to zero. But the shape that we choose, it really matters. Okay, so it's not just a, an interesting visual representation, uh, but it's important in terms of how the shrinkage is performed. So in the case of the lasso regression, if I'm looking at this chart, the contour lines are the least squares error function. The blue diamond is the constraint region for the lasso regression. And that constraint region, you know, in lasso takes the diamond shape. Whereas in rich regression, we see that the shape is a circular. Okay, so the constraint region is is a circle instead of the diamond. And we're going to take a look at you know how to interpret this chart in the in the upcoming slide. But just understand that you know these two different functions have a different constraint region shape. So here's a nice visual that gives us a more detailed breakdown. We can see, looking at our coefficients, which are the least square coefficients, um, that's what those black points are. And the contours, or those little red circles that are going around, um, those are the contours of the RSS as it moves away from the minimum point, so the least square coefficients. Now the lasso coefficients are the point in which the contours connect to the constraint region. So if I'm looking at the lasso function, we actually see that the outer contour connects at the tip of the diamond. And if I look to the right hand side and I'm looking at the ridge regression, we actually see that the outer um, the outer contour connects to the circle at a different point. And that penalty term is the penalty term one or two is really the constraint region that we're looking at in this case. Okay, so um, it's that geometric shape as we had talked about it before, but as we're moving away from OLS regression and we're penalizing these coefficients, um, eventually you know, the coefficients are going to converge against one of these constraint regions, and that's why the shape matters. Now that we've talked about ridge regression and lasso, I want to now shift focus and talk about the concept of elastic nets. When we are working with high dimensional data, and those are data sets with a very large number of independent variables. So imagine you know, not a data set with you know, 30 variables or 40 variables, but imagine you have 1,000 independent variables or 10,000 independent variables. Well, a problem that we're going to find with the model building is that these variables are going to be correlated with other independent variables. Not just have correlations between the dependent and independent variables, but we're actually going to have correlations um, amongst the independent variables. And when this happens, this is the problem of multicollinearity that we had talked about in our loss regression. These correlated variables can sometimes form groups or clusters of correlated variables. So if I have a thousand variables in my data set, you know, I might have 20 variables that are all correlated with each other. Okay. Um, and then I could have pockets of these correlated groups, you know, amongst the overall um, pool of variables that I'm looking at. Now, there are many times where we want to include the entire group in the model selection if one variable has been selected. So imagine, you know, uh, I'm looking at my data set and I find that one variable um, is very strong and I want it to, to be selected into the group. But, you know, by removing the other variables that are correlated to it, 
perhaps I'm losing something in terms of interpretability and the overall predictive performance. And how can I address that? I like to think of this visually for me as the elastic net catching a school of fish instead of singling out a, a single fish. So if I am trying to catch a fish, I see one fish swimming around, I'm going to throw my net and I'm going to actually collect the entire school of these fish. Okay. Um, even though they're correlated with each other, I want to look at the entire group. An example of a data set that has this problem is a leukemia data set. Okay, and this data set contains 7,129 genes with correlation and a tumor type. So I have a bunch of genes um, that are related to leukemia. And then I have an outcome variable that says, you know, um, you either have leukemia or you don't. But within this set of independent variables, these genes, if you will, you know, there's lots of pockets and we need to be able to have regression techniques that can handle this. And that's where elastic net comes into play. The total number of variables that the lasso variable selection procedure is bound by the total number of samples in the data set. Additionally, the lasso fails to perform group selection. It tends to select one variable from a group and ignore the others. So this, these issues with the lasso technique in terms of you know, how it identifies the pool of candidate variables you know, based off of the size of the data and the fact that it can't uh, perform this group selection that we had talked about uh, is a limitation that has to be over overcome in certain circumstances. Now the elastic net, it forms a hybrid of the penalty one and penalty two terms. So if I'm looking at the mathematics behind a ridge and a lasso uh, coefficient determination, you know, we have our penalty one or penalty two terms. In this case, an elastic net actually combines both of them. Okay, and we see that highlighted towards the bottom in blue. So ridge, lasso, and elastic net are all part of the same family with a penalty term of the following. Okay, so this is just a re-expression of this penalty term. But uh, the way that we're re-expressing it, I think, makes a little more sense. If I have an alpha value equaling zero, then we have a ridge regression. If I have an alpha value of 1, then we have a lasso. And if I have a value between these, so between 0 and 1, we have an elastic nut. So we can use this alpha as a specification criteria when we're building these regression models. So if we want to look at various strengths of an elastic nut, you know, we can specify alpha to, to fall somewhere between 0 and 1, depending on how we want if we want it to be more rigid, um, then we move it closer to a zero. If we want it to be more like a lasso, then we move it closer to one. So getting back to that specification that, of that elastic net, I just want to talk very briefly on some elastic net theory. In this case, it's actually what we would call a naive elastic net. Unfortunately, this naive elastic net, it doesn't actually perform well in practice. The parameters are penalized twice with the same alpha level. And that's really why we're calling it a naive in this case. Okay, because it can differentiate uh, between um, the two functions. So to correct this, we can actually use the following function. In this case, um, we're taking our coefficients of the elastic net is equal to 1 plus lambda 2 times the beta of the naive elastic net. So we're actually calculating it um, in two separate iterations. Let's take a look at the visualization of the constrained region for the elastic net. 
So if we remember looking at our constrained regions before we had our diamond shape and we had our circular shape for ridge and lasso, elastic net is something that falls between. So it's not quite circular and it's not quite a diamond. And depending on how you establish these thresholds, um, they can flex in between the points. So when we're looking at the constrained region on the right-hand side here, we see the elastic net uh, represented in red here as falling somewhere in between. But depending on how we specify the alpha level, you know, it can um, flex its shape even more. We can see that the elastic net organizes the coefficients, or a lasso rope, in, into organized groups forming the framework for the elastic net. So if I'm looking at a lasso in this case, and just looking at the shape, I'm imagining the cowboy um, taking the, the rope and spinning it over his head and throwing it out. And you can think of all of these lines as just you know how the, the shape of that, that throw would look like visually. Now, an elastic net in this case is more rigid. Okay, so it, um, it has tighter linear lines, you can see. So I think I tend to be more of a visual learner. So when I'm imagining you know, working with these techniques, just think of the elastic net as just a tighter, more linear representation than a lasso. Lasso is looser. So let's take a final look at the visualizations for a ridge regression lasso and elastic nets. So if we're looking at our ridge trace charts, um, on the left hand side we see our ridge trace. In this case this is a fictional data set that we're looking at. But we see um, that the ridge trace converges to zero at a certain point and it's got these nice smooth lines. It's more linear in terms of how it works. A lasso is looser. We see that at different points, they're hitting the zero um, because of the nature of the penalty term that's being applied to it. Um, but it's not in that smooth linear fashion. And an elastic net falls somewhere in between. So we see more linearity between the shape than a lasso as more related to a ridge in this case. So I think when we look at this, you know, just understand that these visualizations, these ridge traces, help to just kind of denote the shape and understand, you know, the strength of the variables and how um, they function across the ridge trace. We spent a lot of time talking about modern regression theory. I want to now go through and apply this technique um, to a data set. And we're going to take a look at prostate cancer. There are many forms of cancer which humans contract throughout their lifetime, and prostate cancer is a more prevalent form which occurs in males. By having an understanding of the variables and measurements which impact the development of this cancer, this could aid researchers in developing medical treatment options. The data set we will be working with contains various measurements between the level of a prostate-specific antigen, in this case that's our dependent variable, and a number of clinical measures in men who are about to receive a radical um, prostatectomy. The goal for this exercise will be to examine various predictive models that can be leveraged to help model the relationships. As with all my tutorials, I like to first start having an understanding of the data that we're working with. So here's just a description of the variables that we have within the data set. Our goal is to develop various regression models. So we're going to um, we're going to build a linear regression. We're going to do a ridge. We're going to bring lasso and elastic net into this, and we're trying to determine the LPSA variable based upon all of these other variables. So let's take a look at the raw data that we have. We can see it's all numeric in nature. 
um, which is good. And, you know, I see no specific outliers jumping out at me. Um, it looks like data I would expect, but really to do this correctly, we would go through an extensive EDA process, which I had gone through in um, previous lectures. But I just like to get a, a sense for the numbers that I'm working with. And here's a nice way to do it. For brevity's sake, I'm not going to go through all the diagnostics and all the, the, the different approaches to linear regression and understanding the residuals and all of the statistical tests. I'm just going to get right to it. So here, we're going to create a linear regression model to assess the predictive performance. I bring in all of the coefficients. You know, I want to understand you know, what these parameter estimates are, you know, what the various p-values are, and so on and so forth. So now that we've done this, then I'm going to pare it down into a smaller set. I looked at all of the parameter estimates that had statistically significant p-values, and I kept those. If there wasn't a statistically significant p-value, I eliminated it from the model. And what we see is we actually have a smaller group of coefficients in this case to work with. Now there are many different techniques you can take. Uh, that's the approach that I had taken for this exercise. Now in order to assess the predictive performance, in this case we're going to calculate the mean squared error, or the MSE, for this linear regression model. And when we did this, we got a value of 0 0.49262. I now want to go through and see if I can further improve this mean squared error by exploring the utilization of a ridge regression model. So the first step we will utilize would be to calculate the minimum value of lambda to use in the ridge model. After flexing the boundaries of the lambda values that we had discussed, I had determined that 6.5 would be the ideal value. So we then go about and we create our ridge trace to see where the conversions of the coefficients would be to zero. Um, the ridge trace that I'm showing here has a lambda between zero and a thousand. So we can see just by looking at the shape that we still haven't seen the full convergence, but we, we see exactly where it stabilizes. The next ridge trace shows a subset of the original ridge trace, but it's only isolating the values of lambda between 0 and 10. Now in this case I'm bringing all of the variables into this procedure, and when I apply my 6.5 lambda value, that's where I get that vertical line. As we can see by the dashed line, I now then calculated my mean squared error of the model to be 0 0.4601. Let's now build a lasso model. Maybe we can further improve it. I don't know. So I'm going to utilize the R package GLM net for the lasso by establishing the alpha parameter equaling 1. Now there are some diagnostics that I can look at that give me you know, what my minimum lambda value is that I should be using for calculation purposes and uh, various diagnostic plots. In this case, my minimum lambda value was determined to be 0 0.039. Now a comparison of the shrinking of the coefficients between the ridge regression and lasso can give us some clues about the significance of variables. We had talked about this variable selection procedure a little earlier, but I like to actually look at these coefficients because they, they help me to understand more. The variables LCP and Gleason had been reduced to zero, which effectively eliminates them from the lasso model. Also, please note that the variables age and PGG45 are very close to a zero value, which indicates that they are less significant than the other variables. Now I use significant as a term loosely here. Um, I feel that these variables are less important in understanding the overall relationship. Okay. Now they are, from a statistical sense, important in the model because they were not shrunk to zero. The regression model utilizing the lasso had produced 
a mean squared error of 0 0.4725. Finally, let's assess a regression model by utilizing an elastic net. We built the elastic net model using the R package GLM net by establishing the alpha parameter of 0 0.2. Now there are many different thresholds that we can choose. Remember we can choose somewhere between 0 and 1. I just chose in this case to take a, a smaller value of the 0 0.2. When I perform this, I get a a lot of different diagnostic plots and components I can look at, and I also get a value for my minimum lambda of 0 0.112. Well, we first established the minimum lambda to be 0 0.112 for our elastic net. Notice that the rigidness of the shape of the coefficients of the elastic net as compared to the lasso when compared when comparing the penalized L1 norm. So these diagnostic plots from the GLMM net procedure in R gives us an idea of the linearity and rigidity of the shapes of these lines. You see that the elastic net has a much more linear fashion. Lasso is looser in this case, and this is exactly what I would expect to see. And I think this is a nice visual way to highlight the differences between the two techniques for non-technical audiences. You know, understanding you know when you know a lasso, elastic net, ridge regression can be very difficult for non-practitioners. But I think you know using these visualizations here really kind of highlight uh, how the approaches are working. So definitely consider using them in your analysis and your post-analysis. The regression model utilizing the elastic net had produced a mean squared error of 0 0.47115. Well, we've produced all these different models, so let's just um, summarize and recap what we've seen from them. So here's a comparison of the new coefficient values and the predictive performance rank between the regression methods. The coefficient values in the table on the left hand side, the ones that are highlighted in red are equal to zero and have been removed from the final model. So we can see that certain variables are getting eliminated here. Um, we see them being eliminated in both the lasso and the elastic net. And remember our ridge regression doesn't have that variable selection procedure so we will never see ones exactly at 0, 0.00 unless all of them are at zero. But what I find to be much more interesting is the diagram on the right hand side and that's looking at the predictive performance. So we had a, an ordinary least square regression model that we reduced based off of uh, statistical significance of variables. We find that the mean squared error is 0 0.49. It's, it's very good. But when we start incorporating the lasso, the elastic net, and the ridge regression, we actually find that our predictive performance is higher using these techniques than using OLS. And in this case, um, in the way that we approach the modeling, that our ridge regression actually um, was the strongest performer of them all. So this is a very good reason to explore using a different class of regression models. You know, let's not be so narrow-minded and focus on OLS exclusively. And as we're using data that is becoming, uh, you know, higher dimensional, with more independent variables, and that requires us as practitioners to build models that are stronger predictors, you know, even closer to reality, you know, based off of the data that we have. We have to draw from these techniques, and that's why I think that um, ridge regression, elastic nets, and lassos are very important tools in our analytical toolbox. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, it's been a lot of fun talking about this class of models with you. Um, please feel free to check out some of my other tutorials and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.